All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the panel here. Uh, we're pretty excited today to be up here. A unique combination of industry, Coast Guard, and the Navy with a variety of backgrounds to go through the challenges that are out there today around maintenance and maintaining the fleet that we got and some of the challenges that are coming forward. So a wide range of topics uh, hopefully we'll get to go through, ranging from infrastructure, contract modeling, uh, new ships that are coming online, those type of things. And so I would encourage you as the audience, we're gonna leave some time here at the end as in the other panels to get questions from you all. Uh, that's, we really wanna come out of here with answering all of your questions. So we're gonna make sure we leave time for that. Uh, from a format standpoint, we're gonna go through uh, each of the members here, just give a quick background and some initial statements and uh, we'll go from there. So Mike, I'll start with you. Uh, my name is Mike Haycock. I'm the uh, Deputy Director for Surface Ship Maintenance Modernization. and sustainment uh, for the surface fleet for the Navy. Um, I've been in the, the Navy for about two years now. I did some time in the Coast Guard, took, it, took some time off, and then uh, uh, missed um, ship repair, ship acquisitions, and uh, decided to get back into the fray. Um, let, me, let me start by just thanking the Navy League for putting this event on. Uh, as, as, we, as we try to work with industry to improve how we do ship repair, uh, it, it, that requires engagement, and, and these events like this provide those opportunities for engagement. So in addition to, to being able to participate in panels and kind of talk about where our organizations are going and then get uh, feedback and questions from the audience, um, we have unique opportunities to actually walk the floor, uh, visit some of the, uh, the various uh, booths, talk to uh, industry about things that they're doing, um, you know, innovations, uh, you know, advancements in their field, things that might apply to where uh, to our field, and uh, and then maybe have future conversations on how to how to leverage some of those those breakthroughs in technology and stuff, uh, and that's all uh, done uh, by the Navy League here for this event. And then it obviously requires participation uh, by the people who are actually um, you know get those spaces set up and and bring their stuff in uh, to actually share uh, with others who may be interested. So I really appreciate Navy League putting this thing together. Um, for these sorts of events, it's always uh, because of a, a mixed and diverse audience, you never know really what uh, people in the audience want to hear. So what I'm, my intent is to just provide some teasers um, so, of some things that are going on. Then if you're interested, we can cover it in questions. Uh, but I did want to uh, give you a quick overview on, uh, on, on C21 um, for those who may not be aware of it. So I, I think we had a slide uh, or two. I don't know if we could put that up. If not, I will talk in general. Um, so the C21 organization um, is, uh, uh, consists of a series of program offices and directors uh, in C21 proper, and then there's a, there's a couple of, um, field commands, um, CNRMC, the Commander of Naval, uh, Naval Region, Regional Maintenance Centers, which provides oversight of the regional maintenance centers that are, that are um, serving the Navy uh, out, uh, out in the field. And then uh, an organization called SurfMap, uh, which is the surface maintenance engineering uh, planning uh, folks. These are the guys and gals that actually uh, do the programming of maintenance, you know, project what maintenance needs and stuff are. Uh, so within that, that construct, uh, we, 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 have, we had a slide that had a wagon wheel that kind of showed all that, that stuff out, dovetails together. Uh, but within the C21 enterprise, uh, we've got uh, PMS 407 that does modernization of our ships predominantly. 443, uh, which does uh, sustainment uh, and, pro and uh, you know, PARMS, the pro uh, participating acquisition resource managers, um, trying to provide sustainment support. And then PMS 505, which is LCS, which recently migrated over to C21 from PEO ships uh, in October. And then we also have an international programs office where we uh, assist um, our international customers with uh, you know, supporting uh, assets that we provide, whether it's excess defense articles or whether it's foreign military sales. And then we've got uh, through PMS 339, uh, which works um, training systems. So when you go to a Navy base and you see a big uh, a navigational trainer, that sort of thing, PMS 339 does that sort of work. And then the last one of, of import um, is our in ships 
uh, Directorate, which takes care of the ultimate disposition of our ships when they reach the end of their service lives. Uh, the other overview is uh, just a, a quick uh, conversation about the regional maintenance centers. Uh, there are seven of them. So we've got uh, our four deployed regional maintenance center, which is based out of Naples, Italy, Italy with two detachments, one in uh, uh, Manama, Bahrain, and one in uh, Rota, Spain, um, taking care of four deployed assets uh, in 5th and 6th Fleet. And then we've got the Mid-Atlantic uh, Regional Maintenance Center, which is based out of Norfolk, Southeast Regional Maintenance Center out of Mayport, uh, southwest, uh, which is out of um, San Diego, northwest, which is up at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, uh, and then we have uh, one in Hawaii uh, at uh, Pearl Harbor Naval, Sh Naval Shipyard, and then we've got a couple in Japan, in uh, Yokosuka and uh, Sasebo, that take care of four deployed uh, ships uh, out in the, uh, in the indo pac uh, PACOM uh, area of uh, responsibility. And uh, those, those uh, seven RMCs basically provide all the support that we need for our surface enterprise. That's non-nuclear uh, surface ships. So no carriers, no subs, it, it, it's all the surface combatant fleet. Uh, there are four pillars that they operate under. One is contract maintenance uh, oversight, um, putting together contract packages for maintenance and then overseeing the execution of those avails. Uh, another pillar is uh, fleet tech assist, which is being um, the, the, the first line of defense for people on ship when they have a technical issue, they reach out to the RMCs for help. If the RMCs uh, don't have the experience or training, uh, it then gets bumped up to the in-service uh, engineering uh, 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 agencies, the, our, our surface warfare centers uh, throughout the, the Navy. Um, TISRAs is the third pillar. Uh, TISRA is total ships um, uh, assessments that we do. So basically, uh, four times uh, in, a, in a ship's uh, OFRP cycle, We'll go on board and take a look at the systems on board, assess the health of those, and use that for planning availabilities. Um, and then uh, the last one is eye level maintenance. So there's two pieces of eye level maintenance. One is actually uh, helping the ships conduct intermediate level maintenance, and the other piece is training sailors so that they can go back to the ships and have the certifications necessary to work on the equipment. So that's kind of an over, over, uh, overview of C21. Um, C21 is a busy place these days. Uh, for those of you who attended the Surface Navy Association, um, at Vice Admiral Kitchener, who is Commander of Naval uh, Surface Forces, uh, uh, revealed and rolled out his Competitive Edge program. So there's another a no number of initiatives there that we're supporting, including improving fleet introduction uh, and trying to improve our ability to get ships out of availabilities on time. Uh, and then we've got uh, the CNO has uh, uh, kind of laid out uh, what he calls his get, uh, get Real, Get Better. Uh, program and um, that's that's not a surprise in that the stuff he's been trying to do change the culture over the last couple of years uh, is, is kind of summed up by that mantra and that's about uh, having um, healthy self self assessments of ourselves and our organizations and then the get real uh, the get better part is taking corrective action to solve that and a big piece of that is what we're calling uh, our, our, our fix or elevate program if you're unable to fix it at your level don't let it fester elevate it so we can remove barriers and get things moving. So those are some, some big initiatives that are going on. I'm not going to go into, into details on a lot of them. If there's questions, I'm happy to take them. All right. Thanks, Mike. Admiral? Morning, everyone. I'm Chad Jacoby. I'm the Coast Guard's Program Executive Officer and Director of Acquisitions. So um, overseeing ship construction, aircraft, C5, and cyber for the Coast Guard. And if you were at the Coast Guard breakfast this morning, you heard the Commandant say we're building 100 new ships. The second part of that story is that the 100 new ships are larger and much more complex than the ships they're replacing. Some are almost double the displacement of the, the cutters they're displacing. And then, you know, our legacy fleet was built back in the 60s. So obviously building, uh, you know, current ships, you've got the, the new electronics, the new systems that really brings the Coast Guard um, into a, a different layer of engaging with industry. You know, we, we've got, uh, we're gonna need new partners with this new fleet, and I think that's, that's my main message today. Uh, we do have the Coast Guard Yard, um, which only does about 20% of the Coast Guard's maintenance, so we're relying on industry to help us with 80% of the maintenance for the new fleet. We're embracing the, you know, the complexity and the new maintenance requirements a couple different ways. We're 
issuing multi-year contracts whenever possible. We've got some surface life extension programs right now that are operating on five-year contracts. And then we've also been successful getting some multi-year money, which allows us to award contracts across the fiscal years, plan ahead more, uh, which relates to communicating with industry better and earlier about the maintenance requirements. Another piece is what we call product line management. Um, which is how we organize the maintenance uh, organization in the Coast Guard, which may seem like an internal thing, but uh, by us having accountability and responsibility consolidated in one command, uh, it, it allows us to account for funding, parts, maintenance requirements, all the elements that affect uh, cutter reliability and put those requirements out, prioritize them and, and put them out earlier to industry. We also have uh, what's called Surface Acquisition Logistics Center, which is a new command under the, the PEO that for these new classes of ships is developing the maintenance requirements and the logistics packages earlier in the acquisition process. We're doing it more organically than we used to do, which allows us to take in the vendor provided information earlier, develop the maintenance packages and, and be able to have a maintenance strategy in place when these cutters transition from acquisition to sustainment. The, the third piece is probably commonality. Uh, the new Coast Guard fleet is gonna have more commonality across Coast Guard assets and more commonality between Coast Guard and Navy. So a lot of these new assets have 20 plus NTNO systems on it. So uh, a vendor that's used to working with the Navy we'll see common systems when Coast Guard cutters come in for availabilities. So we're at the point in time where there's huge opportunities to, to work with industry on this. We're uh, about to float the first offshore patrol cutter. Uh, should be launched this summer. We're finishing up the design on the polar security cutter. And then we have uh, proposals. We're in source selection for a waterways commerce cutter. So we're early enough in those acquisition programs where um, figuring out those maintenance requirements, the sustainment strategies, and the, the contracts or vendors that we're gonna use to, to sustain that fleet. We're not in extremis, we're, we're at the right part of the acquisition to start working on those or, or finalizing them in some cases. So I think you know, the opportunity of uh, uh, 100 new ships in the Coast Guard uh, is, is ripe for engagement with industry and developing those, uh, those logistics packages and maintenance requirements so that these new round of assets come out of the shipyard, come out of acquisition uh, with that maintenance strategy all figured out and, and move into sustainment with contracts in place, parts on the shelf, and, and maintenance requirements well-defined. Thanks. All right, great. So switching gears a little bit to industry, Justin? Yeah. Hey everyone, I'm Justin Wolf. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Systicon. And as we all know, right, the maintenance of the U.S. fleet is this, this massive effort. It requires a lot of resources, a lot of funding, a lot of manpower, right? And, and what we've seen over the past few years is, is a much, well, a significantly improved ability to apply predictive analytics so that we can understand what we're getting into. Right, you know, as, as we talk about the assessment of health of the ship, of what's the configuration of these assets are, right, and, and everything about it as we think about making sure that we have the right part with the right person, the right support and test equipment in the right place at the right time, you know, there's been some pretty significant, you know, inroads made to, so that we can get in front of this, right? And I'd really like to first applaud the Navy in its digital transformation efforts. You know, I think they're really leading the DOD as we think about, you know, bringing better data to bear, right? Higher quality data, the speed of that information being available so that we can actually, you know, apply these predictive analytics algorithms and, and fully leverage the ability to implement CBM Plus and some of the other initiatives that are out there to be more effective, right? So that we're not flying blind into our maintenance events. I think that's really a, a core capability that you know, we talk about uh, you know, the challenges with data, right? Everybody says, oh, we've got bad data, we've got dirty data, we can't trust it, the maintenance records aren't fully completed. But I think it's actually a lot better than, than people think, and there are some, some really outstanding initiatives across the Navy to 
to, to apply predictive analytics and, and make sure that you know we can anticipate things. So that's All right, great. So briefly about me, and then I'll get on to the questions. Uh, I have the privilege of running BAE Systems ship repair business. We're about 3,300 employees, uh, three shipyards with Jacksonville, Norfolk, and San Diego. Uh, been working with the Navy for a long time, but we also do some commercial work uh, and a little bit of work with the Royal Navy down in uh, Florida as well. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, what the next couple of years are gonna bring. There's gonna be some challenges out there. And as a business, really one of the big themes is around infrastructure and investment um, and really understanding the volume that's out there. So. I'll go through a couple questions here first. Uh, Justin, I'll start with you. you. You talked about the data and the speed. If you were to look at some of the other industries that are out there, this is an extremely fast developing field. And sometimes it's, it's harder in this world to move fast. Uh, what's an industry you would point to that, that has used the data? And then what's kind of that next step? What's that vision of how, how that analytics can be used? Well, it's a great question, right? So, you know, for those that aren't, familiar with Systicon, you know, we support 24 different countries, defense departments. We support a whole array of complex industries, mining, commercial aviation, oil and gas. And, and I think, you know, one of the challenges that the Navy has in general is, is massive, right? If, if you look at United Airlines, right, they've got 800 planes. That's it. So it's pretty easy to, to manage that data set. You know, in, in mining, every mine is kind of its own independent business, right? It might be owned by Rio Tinto, but it's managed quite in a compact way. Uh, so, you know, if you look at mining and offshore oil and gas, they're, they're doing a lot with CBM, right? Uh, an offshore oil and gas rig in the North Sea is a million dollars a day if it's down, right? So there's, a, there's an incentive there to be up, right? And so a lot of those systems, though, are very similar to, you know, there's a gas turbine engine on an oil rig, right? It's very similar to what is on our ships today, a lot of the same kinds of communication and mission equipment. I think there's some lessons to be learned there, uh, for sure, but I think some of that is also just a function of just how small you know, a lot of these other industries really are compared to the Navy. Good. Admiral, uh, you brought up the 100 ships, um, larger size. You, you start to have an overlap with the Navy and the potential to get crowded out there. And then from my perspective in industry, we have to make long-term investment decisions about infrastructure. So just talk me through a little bit about that uh, prediction of how much infrastructure you're gonna need and then the partnership with industry. That's a good question. You know, maybe in the past, we were able to get away with, um, you know, last minute realization of maintenance requirements and, and putting a contract out and, and finding a shipyard or a vendor to help us. But uh, both the, the pace of the industry and the fact that we're, we're probably going to be competing for bigger, bigger yards, more complex availabilities, makes it so we're going to need to um, have the data that I mentioned, maintenance requirements and schedules and sustainment strategies, to be able to predict that out two or three years, work with the Navy to make sure that we have a consistent message to industry that, you know, Coast Guard, Navy combined are gonna require this level of engagement over the next several years. We've, we've, uh, we've started doing that. Um, you know, the five-year contracts are, are another good example of, hey, Coast Guard, predict for the next five years what you're gonna need, and instead of doing five individual contracts, uh, put it all in one contract. Uh, and, you know, right now we're using that for, for big surface life extension programs, but I could see uh, multiple ships on one contract that you know extends the time period. Maybe there's maybe they're end to end. Maybe there's gaps in time there, but uh, more tools to be able to say uh, here is what the Coast Guard requirement is over time, and hopefully over you know year or two or three, and uh, trying to find contracting and planning tools that you know, gets that information out to industry. We've had some successes, but uh, I think there's a lot of room left to. To explore there. No, that's good, Admiral. We had a chance to talk earlier. I mean, from the industry perspective, that uh, knowing whether it's a three or a five year time frame for us makes a huge difference in predictability and cost and infrastructure and investment decisions. So I think you're on the right track there. And the, and the more you can do there, I think you can bring industry on board 
Understand. Uh, because longer term, all of our investment decisions are in that three to five year mark. And uh, having the assurance that that whether it's a dock or a pier or some other technology tool that it's actually going to be used for that period of time is the one thing we need to, to make that investment. So Mike, I, I've had a chance to know you for a couple of years and we've had this dialogue, but I, I find this answer kind of fascinating. If you could compare and contrast your Coast Guard experience, how they would go about maintenance, and then what you came into with the Navy and kind of merge those two together about pluses and minuses, and maybe both sides could learn from one another. I'd be interested in that perspective. Sure, no, I appreciate the question. Um, when, when I've kind of contemplated this, there's, there's two things that immediately come to mind on, on the differences between the two services um, conduct maintenance. Um, one is uh, scale, uh, and, and that's related to, uh, heavily related to modernization. And then, then the other one is uh, uh, data collection. So on, on the scale piece of it, because uh, there's, there's different missions you know, that the Coast Guard and the Navy have, um, part of the Navy's mission is you know, always being ready um, to uh, protect the American way of life uh, on, uh, you know, uh, at sea. And so that, because there's, there's, uh, we have near peers out there, you have to keep up with the Joneses, right? You gotta, you gotta be upgrading your weapon systems, uh, your defensive systems and such. Uh, to make sure that uh, if there if there if it does come to conflict, you can you can you know, come out victorious. Uh, so the Navy is modernizing all the time. There, I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a constant continuous cycle, right? Um, you know, there are there are upgrades to uh, to electronic systems and weapons that are always coming out, and so uh, that that's not something that I I experience in the Coast Guard. So the the Coast Guard modernization uh, periods. Are uh, more uh, incremental, um, you know, uh, more. Uh, uh, they're, they're not continuous, right? So, um, you know, we would when I was in the Coast Guard, we would take an asset, we would we would take a look at it uh, at midlife. What are the things that need to be done to the ship uh, at midlife? You know, take advantage of the opportunity. The ship's going to be down for a while. Uh, that's when you make your big your big uh, modernization efforts. You know, uh, changing out uh, propulsion controls or propulsion systems or Whatever, whatever is obsolete that needs to be changed out. Uh, in, the, in the Navy, they're always doing that sort of thing, right? So it really complicates the availabilities. So when you look at a, a, at a Coast Guard availability, and, and, and I'm dating myself because you know, I left the service a couple of years ago, um, but uh, in a typical availability, uh, was rather short in duration, right? It, it, they, might, they might be eight weeks, 12 weeks, depending on the size of the ship. Um, and with the new national security standards, I, I don't even know how long those availabilities are these days. But they were relatively short compared to Navy availabilities. So you look at a Navy availability, um, you know, they're, they're, most of them are over 100 days. And in some cases, some of them are span years. So we've got availabilities that, that will run three, three years. In some cases, we've got some that are five years in length, right? Um, that requires you to be on your A game all the time. And then there's a lot of change that can happen when you have an availability that long, right? So that's one of the that's one of the things. Um, you know, my time in the Coast Guard, it was a little more contained, um, but not nearly as complex. The, the other thing that I found is, is, is different is kind of the data collection effort. So the Navy, um, we we strive to be uh, to make uh, data informed decisions, and so there is a desire for academic rigor. You know, you collect the data, do an analysis, try to determine what is the right call based upon the data, as opposed to uh, you, you kind of your gut instinct. So, you know, lots of data being collected. So if you're the project manager for an availability, you are in the computer putting in data uh, all the time on the, all the different uh, you know, um, aspects of the availability. And then that data is, is collected and, and, and analyzed. So a good example of that is um, the Navy's um, performed a plan effort, um, which essentially you have to have a plan and you measure your performance against the plan. And so uh, in looking at that, that we've be, been able to determine uh, levers you can pull to make, uh, to influence this, you know, the, uh, the, the performance and such, right? And we didn't have that uh, to that extent when I was in the Coast Guard. And so, um, you know, when you bring people over to our C-21 war room and, and you look on the wall and you see all the stuff that's based on the walls, all this data, um, you know, contract cycle time, um, you know, uh, how long it, uh, it, it takes to get, um, 
uh, new work uh, added to availabilities. Um, the days of maintenance delay, uh, it, it's almost overwhelming, right? And so those are things we pay attention to every day. And I guess there was one more that, that comes to mind that, uh, um, you know, that the Navy uh, cares deeply about. And it's not that the Coast Guard doesn't, but because the Navy is the elephant in the room with the, the largest fleet, it's something the Navy has to consider all the time. That's the industrial base health. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in the Coast Guard, because uh, it, we used tier two level yards and stuff, um, we weren't really as concerned about the impact in, of the industrial base because, because we were kind of a, a smaller player. But in the Navy, with the size of the availabilities, the number of ships, um, you know, what, where the Navy goes can drastically impact the health of the industrial base. So there's not, a, there's not a, a, a week that goes by and many times not even a day that goes by that we're not talking about industrial base health. And how does this, this contracting strategy impact the industrial base? How do we, how do we uh, get the best out of industry, right? right. So that dovetails in with another theme, and then I'll open it up for questions here, is around partnership, trust, teamwork. Those words uh, mean a lot. So I'll, I'll latch on to one of your comments around data and, and, and go to Justin, which is the Navy's got data, I got data, but really to be effective, we have to measure it the same way and we have to share data. So if you could talk a little bit about the challenges that presents you where you have access to data from different areas, but really the value is sharing it to unlock that, unlock the value from it. Well, do you, do you just wanna, your word, sir, you know, if you're gonna pull and understand the impact that each one of these potential levers has on, on capability or mission effectiveness, uh, you need that, that integrated decision environment to be uh, a common sandbox, so to speak, between industry, uh, which of course has a vested interest in maintaining some proprietary edge. Uh, and, and the Navy that maybe has, you know, some reason why they wouldn't want to share everything with, with industry, right? And so, but what we've seen is, you know, through some efforts with PEO MLB and, and some of the, the various uh, uh, like C-21 and PEO ships and things, is we found it's possible, right? You can have common data formats, you can have common data standards, you can put the right information on contract and, and develop that trust so that you so that as the industrial base, you're confident that the Navy is, is using this information to make informed decisions, to make defensible budget decisions so they can go to Congress and explain why they need you know, X number of billions of dollars and, and why that will result in some desired outcome without having this perception that the Navy's trying to rip the work away from industry or something like that, right? So instead of this you know, clash that's perhaps quite common, you know, it can be, you know, a much, much better integrated effort. And I think we're seeing the fruits of some of those uh, efforts, you know, right now, which is great. Yeah. So I'll just, uh, under that theme of trust and partnership and teamwork, I, I would say when we've had successful projects, it's when the teamwork is at its highest. And when we've had unsuccessful, that trust and teamwork isn't there. So Admiral, I'll turn it to you just, uh, you know, to talk a little bit about that teamwork aspect within the Coast Guard. And then, uh, then I'll go to the audience for questions and see if there's going to be a, a line at the microphone or not. Yeah, so I think we're in a trend of uh, joint programs and joint solutions across agencies. We've got the integrated program office for the Polar Security Cutter. So we're building the Polar Security Cutter as a Coast Guard Navy uh, joint effort, which is uh, helping a lot, going really well. Um, we've also implemented a common solution for a DHS financial system across the Coast Guard and all the DHS agencies. We've worked with DOD on a common health record system. Uh, so I think, you know, those are, it raises the difficulty level of a program when you go joint, but there's definitely uh, payoffs for commonality of data and then commonality of message on the Hill and commonality of solutions, either, you know, sustainment benefits or or uh, programmatic benefits across you know, all the agencies that are involved. So it's not, uh, it's not the easy way to go, but it's definitely the, the right way to go as we move forward trying to use common systems for sustainment or, or maintenance benefits or just have the same architecture so we can pull data together. Okay, good. So we'll see audience questions. That means I get to ask the tough questions. Yeah, go, we'll go ahead. Yes, Rick Easton, uh, thanks very much for a great panel. Looking at the uh, peer competitor threats that we're facing, the CNO's NAV plan, what's going on to address you know, more ready ships, 
less backlog of maintenance uh, as we're going forward to make sure that we're ready should, uh, should war happen. Good question, I guess I'll take that one. <laughs> um, we have, in C21, we have over 100 different initiatives uh, aimed at doing that sort of thing. So I'll, I'll just uh, talk about a couple of them. Um, so the, one of the things we're trying to do is shorten availability lengths because every day the ship isn't in availability, it's not operating at sea. And there are opportunity costs associated with that. When, when that ship is being laid up for maintenance, it's not, not conducting its mission. Uh, there, are, there are costs associated with that from, from opportunity costs um, and, uh, and, and, and other things that you just can't get done because ships in maintenance. We've, uh, in looking at data, we've identified that the longer an availability is, the, um, the more likely it is to run late. And so one of the things that we track very closely is days of maintenance delay. So we, we, we get a window from the type commander um, to do the maintenance in. When we, when we uh, pass the end date of that window, we start incurring what we call uh, DOMD, days of maintenance delay. And uh, in, I think it was uh, 2019, the CNO um, saw that as a significant impediment and, and, and issued a challenge, you need to decrease this, uh, I want you to decrease it, uh, um, and within two years have it down to zero. Uh, we put a number of initiatives in place to do that, and I think uh, the first year we were able to decrease our days of maintenance delay by about 40%. I think we're tracking to decrease it another 40% this year. Uh, but uh, the low hanging fruit has been plucked. <laughs> so now, the, now we're getting to the margins where it's more and more difficult to get that done, right? Um, so there are, uh, we are, we've been working closely with industry trying to improve the, dis the speed of decision making. So when, when, uh, uh, when, a, when a shipyard opens a system up, and, uh, and sees problems that aren't uh, identified or covered by the specification, we get a report and, and then we have to do something with that. And, and that may trigger a uh, change to the contract or may trigger actions on the Navy's part through industrial, um, uh, through our, uh, our I-level uh, maintenance programs, that sort of thing. Um, but one of the, the, the big holdups on that is trying to resolve those potential contract changes. So we track those uh, very, very carefully um, our goals for things like small dollar value growth, which are the really small ones under 25,000, um, is a, a matter of a couple days. Um, for um, regular contract changes, we're talking uh, uh, you know, uh, nine to 11 days sort of thing. Um, we're seeing some improvement there, but not nearly what it needs to be. As we work with industry you know, and, and we, we kind of compare notes and such, you know, we're talking about sharing metrics and uh, we see things a little bit differently. Industry tracks those differently than the Navy does. The Navy looks at it from, hey, I got the condition found report, that's my, the clock starts, and then I get it on contract as the, cl the clock ends. Industry looks at it from, well, when you give me your direction on how you want to deal with it, the clock starts, and then when I give you uh, my product back, the, cl the clock ends sort of thing. Uh, and then uh, we also see things uh, differently in terms of priority. So we have to work with industry to do that as well. So trying to reduce days of maintenance delays is, is probably the biggest one. Um, the uh, Commander of Naval Surface Forces, uh, Vice Admiral Kitchener, has, uh, has, has indicated that probably the biggest driver uh, for ships not, uh, for, for force generation uh, is, the, is, is the maintenance cycle. And so uh, we, we're trying to reduce that. So we're, we're gonna try to do, uh, if we can, um, more frequent, um, you know, but smaller, smaller avails. So right now, for like a DDG, the uh, the OFRP, the optimized uh, force uh, uh, program, is is about uh, nine to ten years between dockings. So we want to move that uh, and and do those dockings uh, in uh, maybe a six year mark, right? So you're not surprised uh, at the ten year uh, mark, right? And then we want to start doing smaller avails, get the ships in and out faster. So we're looking at different initiatives we can do. Uh, to, to kind of facilitate that. So th th those are some of the, the big ones we've been working on. The, the only other thing I'd augment that um, is around speed of decisions on changes. And, and then if you can use data to have that change not be a change, but be in the base package. So yeah. if, that's how that all ties together. If, it's, if, if the work is in the base package, that's where we're most effective and where we plan the most. Or if there is a change, regardless of how the decision's made, it's made quickly. Um, We've shown through data that by far the biggest uh, driver of cycle time is, is the time it takes to make changes and those changes get uh, added to the schedule.
good question. Yep. All right, thanks. That was a great panel. Um, so I come from industry, and if there's a widget that's broke, it's really simple. There's good channels for that. Part number one, two, three. You know, industry can monitor bids and contracts and stuff like that. My question is more on the engineering side. Um, so now I'm like with a company that focuses on corrosion. So how can industry become aware of issues that are maybe a little bit more repairable, a little bit more fuzzy as far as we're having this problem, but there's not like a part number associated with something like that? So from my perspective, the biggest thing is uh, the lessons learned for the same class of ship. So we, we operate the same class of ship in multiple shipyards. Our competitors do as well. Um, I think there's still strides of the data that's gathered in your example of how much corrosion is found and where it's found and mapping that out and comparing that to the same class of ship in another port, maybe accounting for some different operational, either the life of the ship or where the ship operated. And so back to what Justin talked about earlier, um, I think your biggest opportunity is around the data we have, along with what the Navy has, and merging that together from an engineering standpoint to attack the toughest areas. We, we've seen some significant places there. Yep. So I'd offer up, you know, I mentioned product line management in my intro, and um, you know where we would struggle with that is if the Coast Guard is fragmented and Florida is worrying about Florida and Alaska is worrying about Alaska, but over the last decade, we've we've modernized the naval engineering side of the Coast Guard to where um, all of the ship availabilities, all of the maintenance that gets completed, all the condition found reports, all the information from the Coast Guard yard goes to one place, Surface Forces Logistics Center, uh, and they have technical authorities on corrosion, on propulsion, so for the first time, we were bringing all that information together and can see trends across asset classes, across regions, um, and some of the levers that the product line manager at Surface Forces Logistics Center have are <clears throat> investing to prevent problems in you know, unreliability or failures or corrosion. So I think, at least for the Coast Guard, that's key is getting that uh, data, the authority and the responsibility and all the levers in the same spot so you can notice it and then take action. I would uh, add a couple things on the Navy <coughs> side. The, uh, the Surface Maintenance Engineering Planning Program, SurfMap, um, collects a lot of data on, on corrosion. And so uh, when we get ready to plan an availability, one of the things that, that SurfMap does is they, they analyze the data for uh, a, you know, a particular tank on a class of a ship. And so we'll, we'll, put, uh, we'll put a front load uh, in, the, in the contract. So the contract may say, hey, I need you to get into this tank. Uh, we need to inspect it. Um, but our analytics will tell us that, uh, that with a very high confidence level, we know that uh, you can expect to do X square foot of, of paint repairs, right? We know that there's gonna be an X linear foot of, uh, of stringers that need to be replaced or X, uh, X square foot of uh, plating that needs to be replaced. And, and so since it's based on data, uh, we'll put that in the contract up front, as, as Mr. Smith was talking about, getting it into the contract so we can deal with it um, so that we can kind of address it and, 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 and you know, they can plan it into their work so it can actually get done, but as opposed to having it as growth later on, there's uh, speed of cycle time, you know, speed of decision making, that sort of thing that would complicate things. So that's one of the things that's, that, uh, that we do uh, uh, you know, on the corrosion piece. We know that there are um, that the different classes of ships have areas that that um, uh, are more prone to corrosion than others. So on a DDG, we know the uptakes and intakes uh, can be problematic. We know the mixing room uh, is it can be a problem. We know that the the bilges uh, in uh, in some of the engine rooms or the auxiliary spaces are are problematic. So we try to address those up front in the class maintenance plans and get those into our contracts as well. Uh, in terms of if if I was uh, uh, in industry looking uh, <coughs> For ways of influencing that, these these uh, events are good ways to to touch base with those of us who do that sort of work, um, and then uh, you know reaching out and talking to the regional uh, maintenance center um, or uh, getting a, an appointment with C21. Um, there's there's ways of kind of getting uh, getting in there and, and kind of sharing you know what what you have to offer and, and how it may make a difference. So.
Hi, uh, Greg Jost, Insight Technology Solutions. Um, Mr. Haycock, you were talking about the differences between the Coast Guard and the Navy. It seemed like maybe the implication was the Coast Guard has a lot to learn from the Navy, or at least catching up in the in the the pace, uh, the continuous stuff. Uh, but what can the Navy learn from the Coast Guard? Well, that's a good question, and I if if I left you with that impression, let me let me clarify that. Okay, there is uh, both services have strengths and, and, and weaknesses. Both of them have uh, things they can learn from one another. So, you know, the Coast Guard, from my experience, I don't want to speak for Admiral Jacoby, uh, is, is agile. You know, they, they, they can move fast on things. The Navy is a big machine, so it, it, it takes time to get, get things done in, in some cases, right? Uh, so that agility is something that the Navy can learn from the Coast Guard. Um, the Coast Guard uh, did a, a major business process uh, reengineering uh, effort in, in the late 2000s, early teens, um, and they created their their, uh, uh, their mission support business model. And, and, and one of the tenets of that was product line management. And, and I won't go into details, I'll let Admiral Jacoby talk about that, but um, the, the beauty of that is there's a single point of accountability uh, in the Coast Guard for, for maintenance. And, and, and everyone uh, who has anything to do with that knows who that is, right? So if I'm the CEO, of, of a national security cutter, I know who the product line manager is. I'm probably on a first name basis. I may know the guy's or the gal's um, spouse's name and their dog's name, right? There's a relationship that's built there. Uh, the Navy is very, very big. It's not quite that simple. The command and control structure is, is much more complicated uh, because of, of the, the nature of the mission and stuff. So one thing that the, the Navy could uh, learn from the Coast Guard is uh, trying to um, bring some of that clarity and that, and that uh, de complexify, if I can make up a word, um, some of the command and control structure. And to that, to that effort, we're, we're trying to do that. You know, we sent uh, the, um, the, the PMs for PMS 407, 443, and 505 um, up to the Coast Guard Yards SFLC um, in, in March to speak with the SFLC commander to kind of see how the Coast Guard does it and see if there's some things that they can bring back with them. I think I'd have the same answer. When you were listing the, uh, you know, the attributes of the, the Navy maintenance structure, I was jealous of the data that you have, yeah. but I also, um, you know, the burden of that big machine, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, well, at least we can be nimble. We may not have it, all of that data, but we can move pretty quickly and, and change directions pretty quickly. So I think that's a benefit. And then I'd throw out one more. Um, you know, there's pluses and minuses to the size of the Coast Guard. Uh, and so the Coast Guard has one PEO uh, across air surface C5 cyber. Uh, the downsides of that is we probably don't have the focus that the Navy has, but the upside is uh, all of the aspects of an asset from the ship, the aircraft, the, the maintenance, the shore facility, uh, development of all those products are all under one PEO, so we we can make prioritizations and trade-offs fairly easily without having to span multiple organizations and, and multiple uh, specialties. So I always try to play that up as a positive, at least, where uh, we can be nimble and we can see the whole organization and infrastructure and make decisions based on all of the aspects, all the costs, all the prioritization. All right. Two more questions and then uh, go ahead. Hi, I'm Maria Hardy. I'm actually one of the technical writers for Coast Guard Acquisitions. And to follow up on that question, um, one of the things that we uh, that I've noticed in the Coast Guard and we're doing a piece on is how even within the Coast Guard, the like you said, the Service Force Logistics uh, Center, they had feedback from some of the crew members that on one of the ice breaking tugs, it was, it was, they weren't getting enough heat. And so they worked with the uh, Surface Force Logistics Center to figure out how to reconfigure the heat system within the ship. And they got it done within like a record amount of time, uh, reduced the electrical load, and they got everything done like, you know, ridiculously fast. But that points to the agility of the Coast Guard because they had people that were experts and engineers within the organization that were able to get that done. And that was a great accomplishment. So they're up in Duluth now and it's, freezing cold, but they're they're nice and warm below deck. <laughs> yep, and I just jump off real quick on that. Uh, when I talk to Coast Guard members, I am amazed at 
the ability to make change in the Coast Guard. If you can do a business case and show that, that uh, there's a return on investment or this helps sailors or it helps the American public, uh, I have been amazed personally that you can champion that and, and, and change things. So I love that about the Coast Guard, that you can uh, come up with an idea, do a little business case, and then implement it. All right, so last question. We'll have to answer it quickly. But yes, hi, um, I'm Mel from uh, uh, Cypress International. The question I had is about uh, really Project Overmatch. So Project Overmatch, you know, we talk about what's going on overseas, but to me, Project Overmatch starts from CONUS. And if you look at an installation, it, shipyard installation doesn't start at the front gate of the shipyard. It starts all the way from basically a contract being signed. So when it comes to data, how is that, how is industry using, I guess, not just when it comes to speeding up, reducing the maintenance cycles, right? How are you using data, not just in the shipyard, but going way left of the shipyard to make sure that the firing order, when it gets to the front gate of the shipyard, is on time and, and on, on target? Well, well, I mean, I'd say, you know, there's, there's been some great strides in, in using mission effectiveness as our primary optimization objective, right? What is required to be mission effective requires understanding and, and quantifying a whole host of, of data elements, right? You've got to understand the ship configuration. You've got to understand what's critical. You've got to have a fairly well-defined failure modes and effects analysis that starts from the piece part level all the way back to the combat systems, the integrated combat systems, the HME system, and, and then totality of that ship itself. If you can have that model and you believe it and, and you can feed it with accurate data over time, very quickly, you're gonna be able to use that for many purposes, right? And so you'll have the right spare parts on board, you'll have the right COSAL, the right OBRP. You'll be able to predict and quantify depot workloads. You'll be able to tell industry what they can expect with regards to component returns and, and ship maintenance and, and you know, corrosion and all the things that we've talked about here today. The key is to continuously update that model, right? It's, it's kind of out of date as soon as that ship leaves the pier. But if we can get better and, and continue to improve that methodology, right, we'll be able to make informed decisions, defend those decisions, apply the right resources in the right area so we're not you know, funding one effort when the bottleneck is somewhere else. Right? And being able to understand that and, and bring that forward will, will enable us to use and continue mission effectiveness as our primary outcome. Good. All right, so we're at a time on the clock. Actually, very good panel, great questions. Appreciate everybody being here, uh, and thank you all.